Apportet autem illum regnare. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Paul today tells the Corinthians, For he must reign. Christ is king over all visible things and all invisible things. What is this like? I would like to describe in the words and the thoughts of St. Augustine and his commentaries of St. John's Gospel to give us a feel of this, and then I would like to apply it to our practical life, in other words, where the rubber meets the road. St. Augustine describes this kingship, saying, Is there anything real momentous that the king of the ages is becoming a king of men? Christ did not become king to exact tribute, nor to arm his followers with weaponry, nor to wage war against their enemies. With these phrases, St. Augustine is suggesting that it's a kingship of this type. Being a king of men is nothing but peanuts, something peripheral, something on the side. But Christ is the king to rule all souls minds and hearts. Now he is king of all the visible realities. Every blade of grass grows through his jurisdictional permission. He is king of everything. But his main concern is to care for all his subjects' eternal interests the health of their immortal souls, the destiny that they have been called to go to heaven. And so therefore he is to lead these believers and to usher into his kingdom those who trust and those who love him. So that Christ becomes a king of men is a condensation, condescension, not a promotion. That the Son of God, God's equal, eternal word of the Heavenly Father, maker of all things, becomes the king of Israel. This is a sign, St. Augustine says, of of mercy not an acquisition of power. But not only over Israel is he king, but over all the Gentiles. For thus says the psalm, Thou art my son, ask of me and I shall give thee the nations for thy inheritance. Now where the rubber meets the road, My dear sisters, today our sister will become a a postulate. Seeing this, I see Luke chapter 5. I would like to invite her to think about this perhaps in her meditation at some point. Imagine a scene. The King of Kings, Christ Jesus our Lord, comes on the shore of the lake of Tiberias. And there, Simon Peter is washing his nets. He's about his bark. And we can imagine that perhaps as Simon Peter and and ink comes in from from the lake in their fishing business, perhaps there were some maidens that were there to give them bologna sandwiches or whatever they needed for the moment. Imagine yourself there helping out this industry of Simon Peter and the greatest man that ever lived and ever will live 
the source and being of all creation, walks on that shoreline and points out a specific boat, the beauty of Christ, the strength, the valor, the absolute serenity, and perhaps hiding it of sorts, but all the preternatural gifts are within our Lord's mind and heart. And he chooses his boat and he tells Simon Peter, Duc en altum, go out to the deep. Go out. It could be very audacious, very daunting. And my dear sister, you're invited not to give out bologna sandwiches anymore as you enter this convent, but to give Simon Peter encouragement with your prayer and sacrifice, with your immolation, your self-giving in the privacy of this convent, within the heart of Christ, who will, t who will demand to St. Peter, Go out into the deep and cast your nets out for a catch. And Peter, for him to do this and to persevere in this task, he needs much more than just a bologna sandwich. He needs a heart. He needs holy affection. He needs those who have a mission that is enthralled in the great enterprise of Christ our Lord. And so therefore, as you enter this convent, life, as we say in Spanish, is not just a cama de rosas, it's not just a bed of roses. And even if it does seem like a bed of roses at time, every rose has its thorns. But what's so important, my dear sister, and sisters, is that we must understand that you today receive the gaze of Christ himself into your souls. This, our King of kings, the King of all hearts, and peculiarly your own today, Christ is yours. Do not be afraid to be received into this bosom of this holy convent. Christ is the only one who doesn't know how to disappoint his loyal subjects. And it may be you might, you might find a rare uh, V-shaped eyebrows among one of your sisters or two as life goes on but you will receive an abundance of a holy affection. Your sisters love you and they receive you and they support you because they themselves are given over to this Christ. As you come into this convent, remember the words that we sang this morning in Lauds of during the hymn. This verse perhaps could be a subject of your meditation. Non arma flagrant impia pax usque firmat federa aridet et concordia tutus stat ordo civicus. What does this mean? No wicked wars rage in that country. Replace that word country with convent. No one's talking behind your back. No one's after you. No one's going to stab you in the back. But peace is the strength of all its treaties. Peace of Christ. The happiness of concord is there. And its civic life stands secure. This means that these four walls is possessed by Christ the King. 
our Lord has planted his standard here and dares the demons to f- take flight. So my dear sister, as you find that this great de- day of enthusiasm kind of wears down, you get into the nitty-gritty of the grind of life. Do not forget that Christ has conquered the hearts of all those who dwell here in this palace of the King. And may you not forget the sweet sway that Christ's persuasive gaze persists and thick and thin. Remember, St. Peter out there throwing his nets. He probably, he was so old, he probably had a little arthritic uh, reaction, pulled a few of his muscles in his back. It's going to be tough throwing out those nets, all these aches and pains of thy vicar. I take them upon myself in prayer and immolation. That you, my dear daughter, the mystical body of Christ, is entering into that most sorrowful part of our Lord's heart. If anyone who thirsts come to me, drink from these sources of living water. As we continue this holy sacrifice of the Mass, let us not forget that beautiful gaze of our Lord. And our Lord in this gaze of communion, prolonging his gaze, is telling you your soul and your heart, O my beloved bride, with you or without you, I shall suffer. I need you because I am love itself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.